Hey YouTube, in this video I'll be talking about Minimax, which is the basis of all finite decision-based games. Uh, the idea is that if you fully map a game to a decision tree and evaluate the end states, you can play perfectly, uh, which is pretty cool. This video won't have any coding, it's purely theoretical, um, but I will be making videos in the future to talk about applying Minimax to specific games, uh, but for now we'll stick to the very basics. Um, so this is an example of a very simple game that visually explains Minimax very well. Um, if you've learned about Minimax before, it probably looks very familiar, um, but the game is very simple. So you have two players, A and B, and they start at the very top there, and they're going to end at one of those numbers at the bottom. And the way they decide which number they end at is basically by saying left or right, and they alternate who gets to decide. So A starts, and they start at the top, and A gets to choose whether they're going to go down the left path or the right path, and then B chooses the next path, and then A goes again and B again. You can see the choices are labeled on the left-hand side there, and they will eventually land at one of those numbers at the bottom. And those are just the numbers 0 through 15 generated in a random order. And A and B have very different goals. A wants to end at the highest possible number, while B wants to end at the lowest possible number. Um, just as with any normal game, usually the opponents have two completely different goals. Um, so before going into how to evaluate something like this, um, just for a moment, think about how this would compare to actual games. So if this were something like tic-tac-toe, the first player would have something like nine branches at the very top because they can place their first X in one of nine squares. And then the second player would have eight branches, um, so on and so forth. Something like chess would be way more complicated, um, but you get the idea. Um, but the cool thing about this specific one is it's much simpler than tic-tac-toe and obviously way simpler than chess But you can evaluate directly what the perfect play is and actually if both players play this game perfectly They will land on the same number every single time um, So if you haven't seen something like this before go ahead and pause your video and try to figure out Where will the players land every single time if they play perfectly? Um, so if you've done that already, then I'll go into the explanation. The end states are the key to positional evaluation. So you're gonna start from the bottom and work your way up. So for example, B makes the final choice. And remember, B wants the lower number. So we don't know what branch B is gonna land at, but we do know that given two choices, B is always going to choose the lower of the two. Um, think in chess, this would be the same thing as saying, if a player has the option to deliver a checkmate in one move, they're going to do it assuming they're a perfect player, because otherwise they would have no reason not to. So B will always choose a 5 over a 12. B will always choose a 14 over a 15, and so on. Um, we know the game has to end with one of these numbers if B plays perfectly. So the other numbers don't matter at all. They don't play any role in figuring out the path of perfect play, so we can just completely remove these from the tree. And now comes the cool part. Since the final decisions are direct for B, we can simplify the tree by one layer. So things become a little bit simpler now. And we've essentially completed one iteration of Minimax. And we're going to do the exact same thing for A now. Remember, A also is a perfect player and wants the biggest number possible, opposite of B, who wants the lower number. So given two options, A will never give B the opportunity to choose the lower number. So A will always pick 14 over 5, A will always pick 6 over 2, and so on and so forth. Uh, this iteration might feel a little less obvious because these are no longer end states. We're now working our way up the tree. But with perfect play, the evaluation at these nodes are as good as final. And this will continue right along up the tree. So once again, the worst of the two options can be ignored and completely removed from the tree. And here we can simplify the tree down to the second level. So hopefully this process is starting to make sense to you. I'll continue evaluating up the tree. This iteration is B's turn, and B always wants the lower number. So B will choose accordingly, and the higher number can just be scrapped. And here the tree can simplify to the top level. So A begins the game, and A wants the higher number, and the 1 can be crossed out. So this is the end of the process. It is now revealed that perfect play from both sides will always lead to a 6. Uh, it seems obvious now, but let's step back for a moment and remember the original problem that we're trying to solve. This is all that the players see. Um, there are big numbers and small numbers on both sides. It's really only after doing the whole process that it becomes very obvious what the perfect path actually is. 
The players will never deviate from this path. So remember, if you're player A and you choose any path outside of this exactly, player B will be able to force you to a lower number. And same thing with B. If you choose any path outside of this, player A will be able to force you to a higher result. So if that's hard to imagine, go ahead and try a few examples for yourself, and you'll see how if the players do anything other than this, it will yield a worse result for them. And as you could probably guess, you can map out a full decision tree of tic-tac-toe in this exact same way and prove that the game is a draw. And in that case, since the game is a draw, it won't have exactly one perfect path. It'll have many perfect paths, all leading to different draw-type positions. Chess is too complicated to prove that the opening position is a draw, but plenty of deeper positions can be evaluated directly. Um, the reason why Minimax is so important is because all tactics and strategy will be revealed for any game from Minimax style thinking. So mapping this path in tic-tac-toe might reveal a scenario where your opponent can't stop two different three in a row threats, or in chess, mapping this path might reveal an interesting forced checkmate pattern. Uh, no matter what game you're playing, Minimax style thinking will greatly increase your appreciation of it. So this was more of a theoretical video, but if you're interested in seeing how Minimax is applied to actual games, uh, subscribe and I'll be posting videos about that soon. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and share. And thanks for watching, so hope to see you next time.